Shalom, everybody. Let's raise our hands. I'm out here in the Father Yahweh. This is Cohen Michael Hawkins. I come before you being seed of your last day's witness, Israel Hawkins, and through your son, Yeshua, Messiah, the high priest of your great house. As we come before you now, Father, we thank you and praise you for another day that you've given life unto us. We thank you for things you hope to accomplish this day and ask that you continue to guard our hearts and minds and help us, Father, to be faithful unto you and be true and to draw closer to you and to unity with one another, Father. We bless you. We thank you and pray that you open our minds of understanding now as we rehearse these great words of our overseer. And we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to do this. And we ask this in Yeshua's name and unity with the body of the priest, we pray. Hallelujah. Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. All right. Let's see. We are on. We are in the 10th chapter here. And this is Holy Spirit with overshadow you, number three, making the connection. Okay. And we just started this last week. Um, this week we're going to start off here on page 75. Page 75. Um. To recap, recap real quickly here, look on the uh, bottom of page 74. This is on, um, ooh, did I, you know that the, the uh, well, let me just go to it. This is Matthew 24, um, I believe it was 24, right? Matthew, yeah, 24. And this is verse 22 where he talks about the many prophets. It's the second paragraph on, on the bottom of page 74. Many prophets will arise and many preachers, many fa false uh, religious counterfeits will arise and try to teach you. And, and notice what he says. Pastor says, when their job is not even to teach you, they are trespassing when they try to teach you. You belong to Yahweh. Okay, You belong to Yahweh. Remember 1 John 9, 5, 19, we, we are servants to whom we obey and we belong to Yahweh and the world belongs to the gods. And you have a teacher set over you in prophecy, and he is the only one who has a right. You know, the thing is, prophecy is what teaches us and gives us the authority to do what we do. All the rest are imposters. So when they try to teach you, that is, they're trespassing when they do it. They're cut off from Yahweh to begin with, even wanting to take the place of the one who was authorized to do so. So they have no authority to do that. But, of course, they attempt to do it. And like Yahweh says, they'll even try and steal his words and pretend as if it's their own. And they have done that with the House of Yahweh literature, too. They've taken it and printed it in their own, uh, presenting like as if it's their own writings. Um, so he goes on here and he says, he talks about this guy who was a former and um, someone tried to take his wife and she, he finally did. So it just shows how Satan can creep into many different forms, uh, you know, to take over a person's life and ruin families and so forth. But notice he continues on here. This is Matthew 24, verses 11 and 12. He says, And many false prophets will arise in many different forms. And because of iniquity, now iniquity, this is one of the vocabulary words, so you might want to highlight. Iniquity means not subject to the law. Okay, so iniquity is, it is, you know, breaking law and you don't keep the law, but it's not being subject to the law. It's what iniquity is. And iniquity is, is wickedness and evilness because you're actually, it's like you shove the law of Yahweh away from you. Okay, but you don't want to be subject to it. And of course, being subject means you submit yourself to it <clears throat> as a servant. So you don't want to serve Yahweh. You, and remember, worship means service. So you don't want to serve Yahweh or worship Yahweh and you push this law away from you. You don't submit yourself to it. And because one is not subject to the law, he will start turning, notice. He'll start turning. So, and this is what starts off, is, is people begin to commit iniquity. And when they begin to co commit iniquity, you know, eventually they will push themselves out of the house of Yahweh. And that's what he's warning about here. Underline this next sentence here. He will start hating, and the root of bitterness will arise within his mind and deceive him even more. Highlight that section. He will start hating, and the root of bitterness will arise within his mind and deceive him even more. Okay, that root of bitterness. You know, Scripture says that, that we're to be firmly rooted and firmly grounded in the truth. And, of course, the truth is the laws of Yahweh. You know, you think about that. Or the root, a root is on the ground. You can't see it. It's hidden, okay? It's, it's hidden, but yet the root holds the plant and the tree in place, you know, and that's really what 
it feeds off of and what it takes into the, the, the tree or the plant. And, and the roots grab hold of the soil and they spread out. You know, you can't see it, but they spread out. Like with the tree, what you see on top, the wind, the, 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 the span of the branches and all of the leaves, that's what is composed of the root system on the ground. The same amount, the same size. So it, so it holds the tree up. And, and so when roots grab a hold to the soil, they spread out. And that's the foundation of a plant or a tree. And it, it's what holds it together in order to continue to live. You know, and, and the roots, when the roots spread, they spread out underneath the ground and they strengthen the plant or the tree. Um, and then, of course, it seeks after the nutrients and feeds it. And so you have to think about what type of nutrients are we allowing to be fed with? It's either negative or positive, you see? And so this root of bitterness is either, you know, we either have truth or we have deception that we're feeding upon. And this root of bitterness, this is a root. It, it, you know, it, it, it takes hold. Without the root, the plant dies or the tree will die. And so you've got to, that root that grabs a hold to it. And that's once that bitterness sets in, that's what would destroy a person. For your references, let's look at Hebrews 12, 15. Hebrews 12, 15. And... Uh, he says, searching diligently so that no one falls short of the honor of Yahweh, so that no root of bitterness, notice, no root of bitterness grows up to cause any trouble. Notice it's going to cause you trouble when you get bitter. And it starts off as a root, a small thing, and then it grows. But because of this, many are defiled. Okay? And the love of many of the wax cold and so forth, as Yeshua talked about, right? So this root, this small root of bitterness grows, it causes trouble, and then defiles you because you become defiled in Yahweh's eyes. And then, of course, in Deuteronomy, in the law itself, Deuteronomy 29 and 18, he says, I solemnly entreat you to enter into the covenant and oath for fear that they might be among you a man, a woman, clan, or tribe this day whose heart would turn away from Yahweh. Notice, heart. Their heart would turn away from Yahweh, our Father, and go and worship the gods of those nations, for fear that there will be among you a root that brings forth gall and wormwood, or poison and bitterness, okay? And of course, that's the consequences of practicing God worship. That's what somebody becomes. They become that way, okay? So if you practice going after the gods, you will act as the gods, and you will become as a god as you think as a god, because that's what you please, want to, you want to please, is the gods, and that's what God worship is about. And that's why it brings forth death. It's completely opposite of your creator. So he goes on here. He says, this is what we're facing right now. We have but a short time, a short time to do what Yahweh tells us next here. Okay. And you can see in all of these sermons how pastor always talks about it's a short time. And you can definitely see that now what he's talking about. Because this iniquity rises up. That is, the breaking of the law will abound in their minds, in their thoughts, in their desires. Remember, we just read in Deuteronomy where it says, if you, your hearts would turn away from Yahweh, okay? The love of many will grow cold, okay? The love of many will grow cold, and there is, is a, a falling away. Um, oh, in the, uh, here's again for your reference notes. First Timaya 4, verse 1. First Timaya 4, verse 1. Okay. He says, Now the Spirit speaks very plainly that in the latter times, notice, the last days, the days in which we're living in now, some would depart from the faith. Remember, the faith. Uh, Yada 1, verse 3 says, you know, that the faith was once and for all given to mankind, and this is what they have departed from. Giving heed, notice what they do. When they depart from the faith, they give heed to seducing spirits, okay? Because these, these spirits will seduce you. And that's exactly what occurred with Adam and Eve. And the seducing spirit came in there, influenced Cain. And then Cain used that same spirit, not spirit holy, but the spirit of Satan, to get his family to fall. Seducing spirits and doctrines, notice, doctrines of demons, okay, doctrines. Well, doctrines is what somebody believes in, something that somebody that practices in the faith, that's what doctrine is, okay? So the doctrines of demons is what the religions of the world are teaching, 
They're teaching the worship of Satan, plain and simple, the worship of Satan. So back to the book here. He says, the love of many will grow cold. That is, as a falling away. But he who endures into the end, Yahshua said, he who endures into the end, all of this, he passes says, that I have just mentioned here, that is taking place in this time period right here, the end. Okay, the end. This is the end. The same will have salvation. The same will have the promise in the kingdom that will put a stop to all the suffering that we see. Okay, it's going to put a stop to all the suffering we see. Remember Revelation uh, 20 and 21 talks about uh, the resurrection and so forth. And he talks about Yahweh Shema coming. And it says that, you know, all when Yahweh will dwell amongst us, all these things will be taken away with us. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no pain. There'll be no more sin. None of this will exist. It will all be taken away from us. But notice what he says here. Turning to Jesus will not stop the suffering. Turning to Jesus is what the world has done now, and that's why they're suffering. That's why they're facing annihilation from nuclear war. It's because they put their trust, so they say, in Jesus, right? You know, you look at the dollar bill, you look at all the different things, you know, they put it on police cars and everything, you know, in God we trust, you know, and of course they call Jesus God, right? So they, 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 they think that Jesus is going to stop all of these things. But if you heard the articles, he says that, that Gahan Yadidia read, then you know that you would not, they would not be live long enough, even if there wasn't for the, even, even if it wasn't for the nuclear war, they still wouldn't live that long. They'd, they'd end up wiping themselves out because the diseases and everything else, everything that Christianity teaches would actually destroy them. So a Christian, the Christians are going to be destroying themselves, you know. And remember, that's what the prophet spoke about. He says, sinners will destroy the sinners. And then he goes on, uh, Yeshua talks about the message, this message. He's, and Pastor says, that you've just heard from me. He says, it's the same as the prophets of old talk. Because remember, he is the witness, okay, and he witnesses the things that the prophets have spoken, okay? Everything you're going to hear in the next few sermons of mine, he says, will be things that will be taught by the prophets and the apostles. And you remember the book, The Lost Face of the Apostles and Prophets, right? It speaks about all of these things that this is, a, and, and Tamiah says, this is the foundation upon which we're built upon, right? We're built upon the foundation based upon the prophets' writings and the disciples' writings, all of these things are a foundation which we, the house of Yahweh is built upon. That's what holds us up. Okay, it was just touched on here, he says, and there, there's so, so you probably won't even realize, he says, what they're saying unless, notice, unless Yahweh has fixed your mind where you could have all of these things together, okay? Yahweh has to fix the mind. <clears throat> and he does that. He fixes the mind so all these things come together, okay? They form like a ball, you know? It's a perfect spear. But if you take one little piece out, one little microscopic piece, it's no longer solid. It's no longer a solid ball. And that's how the law operates, you know? If one little law is broken that somebody thinks is a little simple law, then it affects everything else. It's not whole. It's not complete. But notice, Yahweh has fixed your mind where you could have all these things come together, okay? Uh, so when you see something, it would click with something else like a computer, okay? Um, you always fixed our minds where, where all these things have come together so that when you see something, it would click with something else like a computer, okay? I got to go back to this. Don't turn, if you turn back to, I'll put it on the screen too, but this is on page 66, and this is in chapter 9 here, we just covered, in verse 18. And here's what he says. <clears throat> He's talking about spirit holy, remember. And, and Pastor says, it cannot fight resistance. This spirit holy cannot fight resistance. It can only be taken in by the will of your body, the will of your mind, and the will of your computers. It cannot enter this computer, he's talking about the computers in your body, without that computer opening the gate for it to enter in. Then it enters and starts lubricating and electrifying 
in the places where your body is weak, okay? So what he's saying here is that the, when the computer opens the gate for these things, for Spirit Holy to enter in, because you will it in your body, you will it in your mind, and you open up your computers, okay, to receive in, the, in your body, the computers in your body, the trillions and trillions of computers that your body is made up of, it opens the gate for it to enter in, okay? Then it will enter in, it will start electrifying the place where the body is weak, because remember, the body is electric, okay? So it will begin electrifying these things. Um, now, the... <laughs> Let me just show you this. Um, I, I, I'm going to show you something here because I want, I want you to understand about, the com about computers and about your body and why it likens it to, the, to a computer because of all the computers that are inside your body. And, and because remember, this is what they, mo they, they, they model the computer after the body, the human body, the way it, the way it works. And we know that this circuits and, and, and computers and so forth and even batteries, generation stations and so forth, electrical stations that generate electricity within our cells and produce all of this to keep our bodies alive because our bodies are electric. But there's such a thing in, well, let me just, let me put this up here. Computer logic gates, okay, because our bodies feed the choices that we make. Keep that in mind. Our body computers feed the choices that we make. The term logic refers to the science that studies the principal laws of correct reasoning, okay? The term logic, computer logic. The word logic refers to the science that studies the principles, which are laws, of correct reasoning. Logic requires the act of reasoning by humans in order to form thoughts and opinions, as well as classifications and judgments. Okay, now that should make you think about what the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program teaches, right? About the thoughts and the actions and so forth. So logic, okay, which is based upon correct reasoning, based upon the laws of Yahweh, is what operates our bodies. And, and, and these things come from the choices that we feed within our bodies, okay? Now, um, this is something I learned years and years and years ago when, when I was uh, went to school for computers and so forth. But these are called logic gates. I'm just going to cover three simple ones, okay, just to show you uh, what these are. It's very, very simple. It's not really hard to understand. But this is what computers are made of. Now, this is just a diagram of it, but these are actually tiny circuits. Now, when I'm talking about tiny circuits, I'm talking about circuits that are microscopic dots, okay, put together. These, these things that make up a, a computer in, in itself, the actual main computer board it, itself is layers and layers and layers and layers of circuitry. There's, 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 I forget how many millions of miles or whatever of, of circuits that's inside of a, a computer. But these things are made up of these different things. You've probably heard of a transistor and stuff like that. Well, a transistor is simply uh, three microscopic dots of material, either positive or negative. So you have PNP, positive, negative, and positive, or you have NPN, negative, positive, and negative. And what these things is, when you put these dots together, when electricity flows through it, it can magnify it, and, and this is what amplifiers are. That's what a transistor is. It amplifies the signal and so forth as it feeds the signal coming through with the material that it has. Now, these are three gates, okay? You have an AND gate, which is simple, you have, here's what's called a truth table. If you have no inputs into it, now this is just two, two inputs. This, this, you can, there's many more inputs that you can connect to it. And you can also even actually hook all these circuits together and make a circuit to do something. But if you have two inputs, if you have nothing coming in, you have nothing coming out. If either one of these inputs is a positive, you're still going to get nothing out. Okay, and that's what this represents, the one or zero. When you see one and zero, it's a binary code. That simply means that that's a signal or there's no signal. Either a signal, one, or no signal, zero, okay? So the only way with an AND gate that you can get a signal out is if both of them are turned on, and then you'll get an output being turned on. You'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Or you have an OR gate. An OR gate simply is if either one of these is on, you will get an output. Or if both of them are on, you will get an output. Okay? If neither one of them are on, you won't get an output. 
That's why it says zero equals zero. Then you have an inverter, which simply takes a signal and inverts it. Okay, if there's no signal as an input, the output will be turned on. If the if there is an input, then the output will be turned off. Okay, so what we're saying here is that you simply have in the AND gate, let me put this up. This will probably make more sense when you see this. Okay. In the AND gate, the output is either on or off. So this results when both inputs are the same. Now, this circuit only operates in conjunction with both inputs. Okay. So if either one or both are negative, then the output's going to be negative. Or if both are positive, then the output would be positive. So if we're being fed two sources of negative influence, then we're going to react negatively. On the other hand, if our body computer receives positive influence inputs, then the outcome will also be positive. So with this gate circuit here, the only way you get a positive output is to have a positive input. So in using it, the positive influences result in positive outlook and actions in our lives if we choose to use that circuit, okay? Now, this is why it's all based on choices, okay? Now, the next one, the R gate, this gate actually allows the choice of either one way or the other, okay, to determine your outcome. If you're fed negative influences, then you choose either a negative or, or a positive output, okay? And the same is true with positive influences. The output will be positive or negative, but However, it's your choice. You can have both a negative and a positive influence notice. And the outcome will be a positive one. In other words, a negative influence can result in either a positive or a negative output. Okay, an uh, outcome. So you choose which way you want to accentuate, right? Either the positive or the negative. That's what's called an R gate. Is one way or the other. Now notice this three out of the four inputs here will result in a positive input. Okay. And so the logic gate pretty much gives great results, okay? So when the temptation comes to do wrong, you can choose to react that way or you can choose to perform in a righteous manner. So it's one way or the other depending upon your choice, okay? Now on the inverter gate, of course, that's pretty simple. You know, in choosing this circuit, if there's a negative influence entering into your body, then you can choose to invert it to the opposite output and choose to react in a positive righteousness, right? Or depending upon what you choose, the choices you make, you can also take a, a, a route, a positive thought to it and turn it into a negative one and vice versa. So that's why the scripture says, choose this day whom you will serve. Okay. So that's why, you know, it, it, these things take place. So either you either can, can use any of these circuits or these circuits in combination and stuff within the body. Okay as a computer would use it, and that's how these things would take place, and the choices that you make will actually take place. So I hope that's a little bit clearer. So when you see Pastor talking about the body and the computer and so forth, you can see that the same logic that's used in a physical computer is also made in your brain with the choices that you make, one way or the other. So your mind, as it says, your mind is such a great computer, greater than any man-made one. Back in the book here, he says, it can do this, but it takes some time, effort, and work, and desire, notice, desire. Um, you know, because desire is, is something, well, underline this next, yeah, this, this whole, these next two sentences. You cannot see desire, but desire is a receptor that actually takes and distributes to different portions of the mind. It actually brings actions and reactions into the mind, okay? So desire is a is something that works with you. Now, let's go to this. Desire, this for, this for your reference sources. Desire, okay, desire, in, 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 in Psalm 27, 1, it says, One thing we desired of Yahweh, that we would seek after all the days of our life, that we may dwell in the house of Yahweh to see your beauty and to inquire of your sanctuary. Now, that's what we desire, okay? That should be our great desire, okay? And notice he says, you cannot see desire, but desire is a receptor, okay? 
Webster's Dictionary, receptor says a receptor is a cell or a group of cells that receive stimuli. Of course, stimuli, stimuli is something that rouses or incites to activity. Okay, so a desire will turn on certain things within a cell to start a stimuli or start arousing it to incite it to some form of action. Okay, and this is why, uh, you know, your thoughts will turn into actions. Okay, it's what you what you desire will actually come out. If so, if you desire your body and your mind to do righteousness, then you will perform righteousness. Or if you want to sin, you will perform sin. You will give in to it. You can't see it, but it causes certain activities within the body, okay, to perform some sort of an action, okay, and, and it distributes certain functions within the mind and within the body to trigger action in some other parts okay, of, of your body. So it's something that we always have to be in check. Remember uh, Genesis 4, verse 7, the desire to sin is within you, but you must overcome it, right? You must overcome it. Okay, back to the book here. He says, therefore, when you see this Lord of heaven, and this is Yeshua speaking, therefore, when you see this Lord of heaven, now, Pastor says, this is speaking of the end, saying the message will be preached as a witness to all nations, and then the end, <coughs> which is the last three and a half years, which we're living in, okay? Then the end will come. And jump down to the next verse. Therefore, when you see this Lord of heaven standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Yada flee to the house of Yahweh, Flee into the mountain, the uplifted place, like it says in Isaiah 2. Flee into the mountain of Yahweh. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now highlight this, the rest of this verse. He who is speaking symbolically here of showing how earnest it is at that time, at that time for people to get to the house of Yahweh and stay there. Okay, get to the house of Yahweh and stay there. I want to read you the corrected verses of, of Matthew 24, 15 to 21. It says, um, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolations and the many deadly diseases caused by the many sexual perversions spoken of by Daniel the prophet, the saints will speak at Abel so that those, so that those who read will understand. Then let them let those who reverence Yahweh flee to the two witnesses at the house of Yahweh at Abel. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, nor let him who is in the field come back and get his clothes. And woe to those who are with child. Now, the, the correction on that is, and it will come to pass that they will have children and they will be nursing their babies in those days. Okay, now, of course, they're going to have children and so forth. But there's something about that. Notice the, the version that says, and woe into those who are with child. This is the fifth book of Yahweh, uh, of Israel, chapter 11, verses 49 to 50. And he says the word woe in this scripture comes from the Hebrew word hawa. This word is listed on page 338 of volume one of the Hebrew Aramaic English Dictionary by Marcus Jathro, Jasro which shows this word means to come to pass. There's quite a difference between the words woe and come to pass. When you have this correctly translated, it actually reads, and it will come to pass that they will have children and they will be nursing their babies in those days, in the days of the great tribulation. Praise Yahweh. This nursing is done by priests. They should spell it out for you right there, he says. It's not speaking of a baby sucking milk from the mother. It's a baby sucking knowledge from a priest. And that's what he's doing. He's absorbing knowledge from the priest. Okay? And then continue on. Verse 20. He says, But pray that you do not turn from Yahweh, nor that you turn away from keeping his Sabbath and feast days, and be destroyed. Because remember, Yahweh's Sabbath and his feast are his shadow of protection. Okay? So, let's go back to the book here. Nor let him who is in the field... Not come back to take any clothing. Woe to those who are with child in those days, who are circus, nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. And then there will be great tribulation, such as not come to pass since the beginning, nor will ever be. And that's what we just read, those corrections. Then we see this time that he is speaking of here, the time of the end. It's severed. We're speaking then of the last three and a half years. That is severed, okay? 
And notice, he says, uh, but if any man will say to you, behold, here is the Messiah. Notice that's great deception that's going to take place there. Here's the Messiah. Jesus, that's the Messiah, Lord. That's Messiah, Lord too, Lord, L-A-R-D and L-O-R-D. They're both the same. Remember, they come from the same word. They both go hand in hand. The pig is your Messiah. The dog is the Messiah. This Now, highlight this part. This deception is going to become so great and so numerous that you might even have doubts. So I hope not, but you might. Okay, so we have to be aware that deception will come if we're not fully grounded and rooted in the house of Yahweh constantly. Okay, and this is why you have to be constantly rehearsing these things and rehearsing what the prophets have written to understand all of these things. Okay, so he goes on here. And he says, um, do not believe it. Highlight this part too. Get to the house of Yahweh and there stay in the house of Yahweh. Okay, get to the house of Yahweh and there stay in the house of Yahweh. Don't believe anything. Don't believe that deception. Okay, because notice what Yeshua said, for there will be false messiahs and false prophets. Okay, they're going to show up everywhere. Every place you want to be, you know, they're going to be there showing up. And notice who will show great signs, okay? They're going to show great signs. Um, you know, Yahshua talked about that. Remember in, in Matthew 12, verse 38 to 39, he says, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered and said to them, We desire to see a sign from you. Well, you remember, desire is the stimuli to incite disbelief and hatred for the truth, okay? That's what their desire, desire was, not to learn the truth, but to incite disbelief and hatred for the truth. And that's why they stirred up the people. Verse 39. So he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it. Okay. Because that's not the way that Yahweh works. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't work that. Here's how he works. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, he says, therefore the languages are for a sign, but not to those who believe, for to those who do not believe. However, prophecy is for the believers, not for the unbelievers. And notice, language is for a sign. You remember Yahshua's words? Yachanine 8, 43, he says, Do you not know, do you know why you cannot understand my language? Remember what he says here? Therefore, other languages are for a sign. You know why you don't understand my language? Because you cannot hear my word. You don't hear my message. Okay? And that's why they were always incited to the disbelief and the hatred, and they built this up within the, the minds of the people. <clears throat> That's how they were able to actually, when Yeshua was desiring, they said, you can let him go uh, or, or, or let Barabbas be here. And they said, no, kill him, impale him. They actually incited the crowd to doing evil. Okay, back to the book here. They're going to show great signs. He says, you're going to think that they're very intelligent. They'll look intelligent to you. You say, well, what kind of person looks intelligent? Certainly not an Oki from Oklahoma. He's not going to look that way. But they will actually look intelligent to you. If you ever watch these preachers on television, they try to choose the most intelligent looking ones. If you look at the way that the world does, Yeshua said, do not judge by sight. Remember, he said that in, in Yachanine 724. Don't judge outward appearance, he said. If you judge by sight, you're going to go wrong. OK, and how do you judge? Well, you have to judge the heart. And how do you judge the heart? If his heart was right, he wouldn't be there trying to coax you into committing adultery or going with him. If her heart was right, she wouldn't be there trying to coax you to go with her. Judge them, notice, judge them by what's coming forth from the heart. Okay, because remember, the heart is where the law is written, in the heart and the mind. It's that law that is being taught to you to lead you away. Is that the law that is being taught to you to lead you away? I think not, he says. If the law were taught... You would be more of a pillow than you were before you met him or her. Okay, because that's what the law does. The law builds up. It doesn't tear down. It builds up. So he says, judge. Okay. Um, because you remember. Um, well. He says, don't. He says, judge. Okay. Okay. But judge righteous judgment, okay? And remember, Matthew 15, 18, for your reference, you know, from the mouth, the heart will defile the body. Remember what proceeds forth from the mouth, uh, as Yeshua said. Um, 
great signs would be shown, but signs not what not that's not what Yahweh looks for. He doesn't look for that at all. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at page 76 here. For there will be false messiahs. From where? But probably from within to try and turn you away. You probably will not even realize it when it's taking place, unless you're on guard, as Yeshua said, to be on guard. So be on guard so that no man or woman is able to deceive you. Notice what that says. Be on guard so that no man or woman is able to deceive you. Okay? Um, now, your reference sources here could be 2 Timaya 3, verse 13. That talks about how evil men and impostors will go worse and worse, deceiving and actually being deceived. Okay? So he says, don't let no man or woman deceive you. Okay? He says, be on guard so that no man or woman is able to deceive you. Okay? In other words, don't equip them to what's needed to deceive you. And notice while this deception is being taught, the deceivers themselves are becoming stronger and stronger in their own lies and deception. And another reference source is 1 Yachanine 3, verse 7, where he says, let no man deceive you. If you practice righteousness, you are righteous. Okay? So if you're practicing righteousness, you become righteous in the eyes of Yahweh. Okay? And like 2 Timothy 3.13 says, it's going to grow worse and worse, and they're going to be deceiving themselves and deceiving others. And actually, they become even worse than what they were before, as Yeshua said, because of, of what they continue to, to follow, rather than cleansing themselves and trying to get rid of these things and get away from the, the evil spirits. You know, Instead, they entice them and listen to them. And as we read earlier, they follow the doctrines of demons, right? Not the doctrines of Yahweh. Okay, back in the book here, it says, Who will show great signs and wonders? And I'm sorry, I did not number these verses this time. Uh, and they will show great signs and wonders. They would just look for the bold. Who will show great signs and wonders? They will be great looking. Insomuch that if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. He says, Behold, Yahshua said now, He said, Behold, I've warned you before, so that when they say to you, you know, behold, come to me, you know, come to bed or whatever, whatever kind of lies and deception to, to pull you into sin is, don't listen to it, as he says. Don't follow this. He says, if you remember before the feast, he says, I was talking about spirit holy. Now, underline this or highlight it or whatever. Spirit holy is within the framework of ownership. And spirit holy teaches this. Okay. It's in the framework of ownership because Spirit holy is, is, is spirit that is, that is holy. It, it's, it's sacred in the eyes of Yahweh, okay? It's his spirit, okay? And Yahweh, of course, as the scripture says, be holy as Yahweh is holy, or be sacred as Yahweh is sacred, any way you want to say it. The thing is, is that it teaches ownership because this belongs to Yahweh. It doesn't belong to man, and it doesn't belong to Satan. This is spirit that comes forth from Yahweh. So it has within, the, within it the frames of ownership. Okay, now, um, he continues and he says, I know that it breaks a man's heart to see his daughter or his wife or betrothed, molested or seduced by another person. Ownership is something that you should be able to trust in. If it's not according to that, it's not spirit holy. Okay, spirit holy is is spirit that makes you into the image and likeness of Yahweh, okay? So if it's, if it's against that, then it's not of Yahweh. And this is what we see taking place constantly throughout the world. It, it, it's taught. In fact, you know, he says, I know it breaks a man's heart to see, see his daughter or his wife or betrothed, molested or seduced by another person. And yet, what did they do with their children? They entice them to go out and to date. What the law of Yahweh says, do not cause your son or your daughter to commit whoredom. And yet, they, they practice this, they push this, and it comes early and early and early age, you know, where their, their, their sons and their daughters will go out, and they, what do they do? Of course, they say they go and they chaperone and stuff, you know, but it's like chaperone's a thing of the past. They just let them do what they want to do. You know, they don't do it. 
They don't follow them. And then when they get old enough, they, when they think they don't need to be chaperoned, remember, they just let them go off by themselves. Well, what do they expect them to be doing? You know? Ownership is something you should be able to trust in. If it is not according to that, it's not spirit holy. If it's an unholy spirit that is coaxing you there, then you better believe you're going to end up falling into something that is unholy, okay? Unholy activities. Because that's the spirit that's guiding you. That's the spirit that's leading you. He says, I've talked about the spirit holy. If, you're, if you do not remember, he says, you need to get the sermons. Well, that's what we just talked about, the sermon, two sermons before this one. And this is the one that completes it. But notice he says, it must have a connection with Yahweh. Okay, he says, I know I didn't make that clear, but I'm going to before this is out. Okay, it must make a connection with Yahweh. Now, we talked about this before previously where he made mention about this connection with Yahweh. And remember, that's the, the, actually the, this, this whole book here is making the connection with Yahweh. That's the, the title of this whole book of Israel. So it must make that connection with Yahweh. It's, it's got, there, there has to be that connection there to where, you remember if you read about Spirit Holy, how it, it's like, you know, our bodies are electric, and this signal, the spirit, the signal, when our, when our computers make connection with Yahweh's computers, you see, in, with computers, you have a server, and like when you get on the internet, you, you dial in, and when you go to a website, okay, that website is, is, is only a server, okay? A server is, is, is called a server because it serves the other computers, okay? The, the other computers come in, you log in, you make a request, and all the information is there, and then the information goes out, and it serves everybody else, okay, and all the other computers that are connected to it. It's the same with Yahweh. We have to make that connection with Yahweh so that when we make our request, our, our prayers are made known, and, and the way that that's made known to Yahweh, he knows it's there, is because just like we, re, we saw these circuits, and we can make decisions, and we can use these end gates or our gates or an inverters, you know, we can turn our minds around and think, you know, we can have an unrighteous thought. We can repent and out comes righteousness. OK, or we can have a choice of either doing right or doing wrong, you know, being tempted. We're doing right or doing wrong, but then we choose to do right. Well, there's an or gate. You did one way or the other. And then you have the and gate where you can have, you know, positive influences coming in and where positive influence is going to go out. But if you got a negative influence coming in and you switch to that and gate, you're going to have a negative output, you know, your attitude would be negative and everything else, but it's the choices that you make. And this is what our, our bodies are made out of is these choices. This, this, and that's how we make this connection with our heavenly father. So he says, uh, the laws and the statutes and the judgments, every intricate little part, okay. Every intricate little part, these laws, these statutes, and these judgments. Okay. And reference for that is Deuteronomy 6, 1. Remember where it says, these are the laws that you must teach, my laws, my statutes, and my judgments. And this is what will make us holy and righteous in Yahweh's sight. Um, he says, every one of them, every one of them, intricate. Now, intricate refers to something that's complex and interrelating, okay? And because Yahweh's laws are complex, okay? They're complex, and but one law interrelates with another law. And that together, that's just what makes a whole, the whole body of the law of Yahweh. You remember, in Job 2, verse 10, he says, whoever keeps the whole law yet offends in one point, he's guilty of all, okay? So if you break one, you have broken them all in that sense, okay? So they're very intricate. You have law, statutes, and judgment. Now, every little part plays a part and brings it all together. Every one of them has to do with bringing complete, notice, complete, Peace, love, joy, satisfaction, and trust. Now, these are all the things that we desire in our lives. Peace, love, joy, satisfaction, and trust. <clears throat> he says, if these are kept, then you can trust your brothers, your sisters, and everyone who has given their hearts to keeping these. Okay, Because it's not this, just that you can trust someone, but you must know what's in their heart. Okay, you must know what's in their heart. If you know the laws of Yahweh in their hearts, these laws, these statutes, and these judgments, and then they strive to keep every intricate little part of it, then you know you can trust that person because you know that they're seeking after Yahweh and they won't do you wrong. Okay, and that's what he says here. You know you can trust them. 
when they break one, he says, you don't know it any longer. You realize what a fraud this, this was that you were dealing with. It's hard to ever gain that trust back, you know, because the fact that it, it puts up a, a, a barrier. It's like, you know, they did wrong. They did me wrong. How could they do that when they say they keep the laws of Yahweh? Because that's hypocritical, you know. Now think of Yahweh who is working to bring you into a kingdom that keeps every intricate part of that law. Every intricate part of that law. Like Jacob 2.10 says, you know, if you keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking them all. Because it's, it's intricate. It's all pulling together as one unit. Okay, and that's the way that Yahweh's law is set up. It has to be set up that way. <clears throat> because that's the only way it will work. And Yahweh's law is proven and true. So he knows exactly what's going to work and what's not going to work. And he's thought all these things through. So he knows that in, in certain parts of his law, certain things have to be kept. And if they are, even though you don't realize how important they are, still on the outcome, you will see the importance of them. And he says, now remember, he established the kingdom under Moshe. He set captains over fifties. He set captains over tens and so forth. Now think about it, okay? He set captains over tens, over thousands, hundreds, over thousands, and so forth, okay? You see the same thing in the house of Yahweh. That's why, that's why there's supervisors. That's why there's, there's different office holders and stuff. And that's why there's different responsibilities <clears throat> within the house of Yahweh. Because think about it. This is what's going to go on throughout all eternity. Throughout all eternity, you will have people, you will have these beings, whoever you're over, you're going to be over tens of thousands of millions and so forth, you know, billions and so forth. You know, when you have a whole planet, you'll have billions and billions of beings, trillions of beings that you'll be over. OK, but you will have to be able to learn that this what the, this this law of Yahweh means in order to comprehend why it's so extremely important to listen to the supervisor and to follow the instructions that's given to you by your supervisors. Because remember, as it says in Hebrews um, 12, 7 and 17, obey those who have the rule over you so they do their part with joy and so forth because they're responsible for you, it says, right? So there's a very valuable lessons that are there to learn. Okay, back to the book here. He says, you remember he established the kingdom under Moshe. He set captains over 50s, over 10s and so forth. Do you remember how people broke away from that? He says, do you remember how people even broke away from Yeshua? They left Yeshua because he was teaching these same laws. You remember, he asked his disciples in, in Yachanan 6.67, he asked his disciples, he says, will you leave me also? You know, will you leave me also? Because the multitudes, remember, he fed thousands. Remember, he fed 4,000, 5,000. You know, that's, and if that was at two different locations and two different groups of people, that's 9,000 people right there. You know, and, and yet all of these people left him at one point in time. And so he turned to the disciples. He says, will you leave me also? Just think how, how, how hard that was on Yahshua at that time. So he said, turn to Matthew 18. He says, I know you think you understand this, but I know you do not understand it. He says, I want, to, I want you to pay close attention because a lot ties into what Yahshua is trying to teach here. He says, I don't think you can understand the other without knowing what Yeshua said and taught right here. And this is important. Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Yeshua asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of Yahweh? Now, get this in your mind, because this is a question that he's trying to answer here. But it's not an easy question for you to understand the answer to. Now, highlight the rest of that, that verse if you have a cardinal mind, then you're going to be thinking cardinally, as you would in looking upon a person's outward features and judging that person by how he looks or how his nose is shaped. OK, so underline that or highlight it. If you are, have a cardinal mind, then you're going to be thinking cardinally, as you would in looking upon a person's outward features and judging that person by how he looks or how his nose is shaped. If you remember, Samuel was sent to look for David, remember, to anoint him as king. And when he got to 
David's father's house. He went, he looked at all of his brothers and so forth. And, and notice in 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7, in verse 6, he says, when he came in and looked at Eliab, and he thought, oh, surely Yahweh's anointed stands in front of me. But notice, but Yahweh said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his height, because I have refused him. Yahweh does not see things as a man sees them. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. Okay? Yahweh looks at the heart. Keep that in mind. Yahweh looks at the heart. Okay? Because Yahweh judges what's in a person's heart. And remember, Acts 13, 22 says, And when he had removed him, he raised him, talking about Saul, he raised up for them, that's Israel, he raised up for them, the nation, David as a king to whom he also gave testimony. And this is Yahweh. Yahweh gave testimony and says, I have found David, the son of Yeshi, a man after my own heart who will perform all my will. Remember the computers. Remember what we read earlier where he said the computers, what you intake into the computers will be by the will of your computer, by the will of your mind, by the will of your body, right? I have found David, a man after my own heart. Remember, Yahweh judges the heart. Yahweh looks at the heart, remember? Yahweh looks at the heart, not the outward appearance of man, okay? So he looked upon David and he saw the heart of David. He knew that David's heart was right. He knew that, that even though David was David, he was a, a human being, he could fall and fall short at times and he could sin, but he was quick to repent. And that's what Yahweh looks at. He looks and judges our hearts. He looks at what's in our hearts and our minds because that's the place where Yahweh writes these things. You know, Yahweh takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to make man into his image. And he looks at the place where his law is written which is, this is how the connection is made with him, okay? And Yahshua said, I and my father are one. Remember, and he says, and we will come to make our abode with you. Well, how? You know, it's not like they turned small and they squeezed themselves within us, right? It's through what's placed in our hearts, okay? And if we allow the law to be written there, then we are with one heart, with Yahweh and Yahshua. And that's how they can make our abode with us. And that's what he saw in David. He saw David and he says, David is a man after my own heart who will perform my will. Okay. He saw, he saw how he was made. Remember, it says we're intricately made and fearfully and wonderfully made and so forth. You know, Yahweh saw in, our, in the inner beings of David that he had what was capable of being made into someone like himself. And that's what he did. So now we see why you know, Yahweh told Samuel, he looks at the heart. You know, Yahweh saw himself in David. Okay, and that's the reason why it's the same is true for us today. That's why, you know, we have the saying in the meaning where we understand, I am Yahweh to you and you are Yahweh to me. Right? So Yahweh sees himself in his people as he forms us into his image and likeness. Okay, let's go back up here to the top of the page here. Continuing the book, he says, they're making people over now. He says, I guess you have noticed this. I think what Yahshua said. Yahshua said, don't judge outward appearance. Okay, but here's what the world is doing. They're making themselves, uh, their whole bodies. They're, make, they're having makeovers. He says, I would take this oaky face here and go to one of these guys and actually be handsome. They have a hand, make a handsome body. Yeah, I would make it be making desirable, he says. They can even put some tucks here and take some fat out there in your face and in your body. And then when you walk out of here, out of there, you know, your own son or your daughter doesn't even know you. And they would probably be lusting after you. And he talks about something he saw on, on the show at one time. I mean, on TV, he says, if I didn't know this was taking place, he says, I wouldn't say anything about it. He says, but they had this information on the news the other day. One man, I think he was 31 years of age. His mother had just had all of this work done on her body. And he said he found himself drawn to her. And he says if he had to watch that. Then they showed on camera where the two of them were coming together. He said you could see it in the man's eyes and you could hear the cheers from the audience. Like this was something great. He says at that time if I had been eating I would have vomited. 
Well, this is the sickness of the world, and this is what you get from Jesus when you lay it all on Jesus, right? Because righteousness is not passed on. Righteousness is not based upon outward appearance. You know, it, it, it's what or what a person seems right in his own heart, because the scripture says that don't lean on your own understanding, you're going to go wrong. But righteousness is in the heart, is built into the heart, into the heart and the mind of a person, how he thinks, how he reacts, how he carries himself. It's not outward appearance, but Jesus says, laid all on Jesus, and, you know, you can sin all that you want. Jesus done, he done forgave you of your sins, so you can just keep on going, you know. But that's not what Yahshua said. And the scripture says that Yeshua died for our past sins. We are responsible for our present and future sins. And that's why we have the blessings of confessing and going before Yahweh and actually for him allowing to him to forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. <clears throat> and then we overcome. Through our strivings, we will be found acceptable. Continuing here, he says, At that time, the disciples came to him, and they wanted to know about his greatness. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of Yahweh? Okay. And that's what they were arguing, remember. And so then Yahshua, notice it says, Then Yahshua called a little child and set it in the midst of them and said, Truly I said to you, unless you are converted, become like little children. Little children. Now highlight the rest of this verse. You become like little children. Now that's not to be led astray as a little child, but it's to become teachable by the prophesied teacher or organization that Yahweh will build up and that he has prophesied and has brought to pass. Well, remember what we read in, in Matthew 24, 19 about they would give suck in those days. And he said that that's the priests teaching the people. Okay. The children is the children nursing from the priests, learning from the priests to be able to know what righteousness is, to grow up into righteousness. Um, <clears throat> now notice the next verse. Yeshua says, unless you are converted and become like this little child. Notice that word unless, okay? Because unless is a conditional phrase, okay? There, there's no way out of it. There has to, has to be like this or else the heart's not right and there won't be any connection made with Yahweh. Plain and simple. Unless you are converted and you become like this little child, in other words, you must become teachable like this little child. You must desire that righteousness as a little child. Or you will not enter into the kingdom. No, you're going to fall away, he says. You will not endure as we are told there in this last portion of time that we are in. When the tests are going to become the hardest. And they are getting harder, right? The tests are getting harder. Therefore, whosoever humbles, Yeshua said, whoever humbles himself, whoever well, Pastor says 90 sermons could be preached on this word humble right here. But Yeshua said, like this little child, whoever humbles themselves like this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of Yahweh. And that's what he's trying to teach his disciples. Okay, Whoever receives one of these little ones like this in my name receives me. Why? Because if you can receive someone who is sent by someone who is sent, then you can be sent. You can become one who is sent as well. You have to learn that lesson. That is, he says, this child who has humbled himself and become Yahweh's instrument in his house, his working instrument, instrument. Now, in Webster's Dictionary of the American English, 1828 edition, the word instrument is from the Latin word instrumentum, which means to prepare that which is prepared, okay, to prepare or that which is prepared. And it also means that which is subversive to the execution of a plan. We think it's Yahweh's plan and it's Yahweh's purpose for mankind. And it's applicable to persons or things. Persons or things. So to become an instrument, you have to prepare yourself so that you can be used in that plan of Yahweh for the purpose that Yahweh has for each and every one who is called out to be a part of his house, to be a part of his family, to work together, to become like this little child that is teachable and desires to have his heart right with Yahweh, okay? Because that's what it's all about. We have to become as a child of Yahweh who's teachable so we can have a part of that plan, okay? So that he, he's prepared this for us. And before we were ever born, remember, we were part of this plan and he wants to execute this. That's why it says Yahweh 
is desiring to work within us and he will. And that's why he says, remember, work on this and then add this. You do that, then you can add this. And if you add this, then add this and add this and add this and add this. And finally, by the time he gets to the end saying all of these things to add, he says, if you do these things, you'll have an interest into the kingdom of Yahweh and you will not fail. Right. You won't fail. You will not fail if you do what Yahweh says. So we have to become instruments that Yahweh can use within this house. If we fail to do that, then we will not make that connection with Yahweh. We will take those secrets that's inside of our bodies, these trillions and trillions of computers, and we'll be feeding them, allowing them to be fed the wrong signals. So instead of always thinking the positive and reacting to the negative to turn it into positive, then we will be switching, allowing these circuits to switch on and off and giving the wrong output. Okay, and we won't be found righteous in Yahweh's eyes. <clears throat> okay, we got to stop here on bottom of page 76. And we'll start off on page 77 in the next class. Yahweh bless you. Will you please go ahead and stand if you can? We'll have closing prayer. Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is Cohen Michael Hawkins. Ask him to come before you. Being seed of your last day's witness is Rebel Hawkins. And three beloved son, Yahshua Messiah, the high priest of your great house. We do love you, Father. We thank you for this great opportunity you've given to us to prove ourselves. Help us, Father, in our weaknesses and our shortcomings so that we can prove ourselves worthy to you, Father, that you can see this desire within our hearts and within our minds, that we can take the things that you're teaching us, all the positive things, Father, and, and, and put them within our, our bodies and our minds, Father Yahweh, to turn on the circuits so that our, our, our actions, our thoughts, everything that we do, Father, can be positive and that you be well pleased with it. And when we fall short, Father Yahweh, help us to be able to to repent, Father, and to turn those things around so that you will be well pleased with us. We do love you. We thank you, Father, for the great opportunity we have where we can go before the priest and confess our sins and to make that connection with you once again, Father Yahweh, for your holy Sabbath day where we're taught your precious word. We do love you and thank you. We ask and pray you strengthen us and help us be with us throughout this rest of this week until you bring us to another Sabbath day to be strengthened in your word. We love you. We thank you, Father. We ask these things in unity with the body of the priest, we pray. Hallelujah, Yahweh.